Put up your hand if there's a spare seat on your right. Okay, we have about, we have a good 20. Put up two hands if you have two spare seats on your right, because I see some groups of two. What's that? Over there. Okay, so we got a good, can you bring everyone in? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're almost done. We just got uh, two hours of panel and discussion, and if we haven't heard everything about animal consciousness by now, we certainly will have by, uh, by 6 p.m. We have a great group for this final panel discussion. People are going to uh, offer us their reflections on the conference as a whole and on their own particular perspectives on animal consciousness. We've got a really diverse and interesting group. The way it's going to work is we'll, uh, we'll start with Dan Dennett, then we'll go to Stephen Hanna. Th those two have slides, so um, we'll keep the panel down on the, uh, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the audience for the first two talks. Then we'll bring everyone up, and we'll have Jennifer uh, Alexandra Horowitz, Jennifer Duquette, and David Edelman. I think we've got a uh, um, Dan as a philosopher. Stephen is a, uh, a psychologist, very interested in animal consciousness. Uh, Alexandra's in the, uh, the, has a dog cognition lab at Barnard. Jennifer is environmental sciences, done very influential work there. And David Edelman has an octopus lab, very interested in the theory of consciousness. So we've got a very um, broad and interesting group to, uh, to hear from. But without further ado, we have our first speaker who needs no introduction. Uh, Dan Denner has done a huge amount uh, throughout this field to inspire all of us in thinking about animals, thinking about consciousness, and in thinking about the two together, animal consciousness. So please welcome your friend and mine, Daniel Dennett. Let's see. Is that on? Yes. But I don't want to lean way forward like that. Well, it's not on? Oh, I'll hold it. Okay. Uh, I wrote these notes last night after a long day of listening and thinking, and uh, we'll see how it goes after all that. <laughs> Suffering matters, but it's not the only thing that matters. I'll get to that later. Why does it matter? Is it on? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, one answer is because it's awful. Well, what makes it awful? Some of you may be inclined to say, it's just intrinsically awful. This is a non-answer. <laughs> this is a skyhook, shame on you. That <laughs> will not do. If, if suffering is awful, We've got to explain how it differs from things that aren't awful. And saying it's intrinsically awful is just evading the question. Well, I'm going to approach this via a few fixed points. Now, these are fixed for me, and probably some of them are not fixed for you, although I think most of them are fixed for a lot of the people who have been speaking here. And I'm not going to defend them here, but so you may want to mark some of them as the, the point of departure for you. First point, there's no double transduction in the brain. That is to say, it's spike trains all the way. Light gets transduced into spike trains. Auditory gets transduced into spike trains. All you got going on in your brain is neural spike trains. And at no point, at no point, are they transduced in the brain into some other medium, a second transduction, the way CDs get translated into another medium when you put them on your player. It's, uh, it's spike trains all the way. So consciousness is not a special medium. It's not a medium at all. The only medium in your brain is spike trains. Well, consciousness must then be a complex of talents or cognitive abilities realized in the medium of neural interactions. I don't see how it could be anything else. 
And these emerged gradually and spottily in evolution. Like Peter Godfrey Smith, I'm quite fond of convergent evolution and independent uh, evolution, and I think we ought want to take that very seriously. Now, suffering could be interference with those abilities. Could be. Now, in the first session yesterday, I thought it was a wonderful session. We had Peter Godfrey Smith, uh, Todd, Andy, Eva, and they all developed evolutionary and hence functionalistic considerations, seeking out by reverse engineering the reasons why consciousness exists, what it is, and how it works. And we learned that they all agree that some cephalopods, arthropods, and vertebrates have the main tools, organs, capabilities for consciousness. But they flirt with consciousness, as Marion put it, Brava Marion, I think that's a great term. They didn't, don't say that they are functionalists. They hint, except for Todd, that there is a hard problem. And they are addressing it. But that's just a hint. Todd advertises that he's addressing the hard problem, the explanatory gap and qualia. But if you look more closely at what he had to say, he's also articulating only functional considerations. Drawing conclusions from facts of functional neuroanatomy that he was speculatively reverse engineering. Bravo. They're all four of them playing the same game, doing the same kind of science. But, as I say, they're flirting with the idea that they're addressing the hard problem when they are scrupulously attending, as any evolutionist must, to the functional details, to the reverse engineering. Because that's all you can do when you're doing an evolution. So I was a little bit concerned, how was I going to uh, draw this out to people? Well, Ned and Stephen came to the rescue. Both Ned and Stephen came to my rescue by driving home the points themselves in the question session. All these competences, cognitive abilities, that sort of could be done without consciousness, without qualia, says Ned. What about feeling, said Stephen. And several objected from the audience. You say you're talking about consciousness, but instead you're just elaborating the different cognitive abilities of your cephalopods, your bees, your vertebrates. And what does that have to do with consciousness? And at this point, just to see what the uh, stakes are, we can remind ourselves of Jeremy Bentham, who said, you know, uh, it's not can they reason, but do they suffer? And it looks, it looked to many as if our four session one panelists were talking more about cognitive abilities, the ability and effect to reason, rather than whether they could suffer. Well, here's what I think they should have replied to those questions, and they more or less did. Not reasoning in particular, but responding to many appropriate ways, in many appropriate ways, to the nociception. Now later, Marion said that she wants to point to the complexity of the machinery that responds to the nociceptors, quite independently of any qualia or hard problem. She asks why we should care whether there are pain qualia present. And here David comes to the rescue. He says, why should we care about the complexity of the machinery? At last, David is on the verge of asking what I call the hard question. And then what happens? This is not a rhetorical question, and I'm going to answer it. <laughs> complexity is worth caring about, but not just any complexity. The complexity that is worth caring about is the wonderful complexity that Eva described in her talk. I'm going to try to illustrate this with a, with a slight digression for a moment. I wonder if this is going to work. Yes, it is, I think. Some of you know these. These are Carl Sims virtual creatures that evolved. How many of you have seen these before? Well, it's, it's artificial evolution. Brilliant. I've used this video many times to uh, uh, explain uh, or demonstrate the incredible inventive creative <coughs> powers of a 
very straightforward evolutionary process. Now, the reason I mention that is that Eva it was described, I'm going to somewhat dramatize what she said. I hope she approves. Uh, I'm going to call it Eva's major transition. Now, Sims virtual creatures, you just saw an example there, have one great flaw. The genome in the developmental program is backstage. It's not in the model and hence not itself under selection pressure. It could not, for instance, evolve a longer genome, for instance, or a new chromosome because that part of the whole simulation was just backstage. It wasn't, it wasn't under selection pressure at all. In other words, what it lacked is unlimited heredity, one of the very important properties that Maynard Smith and Sakmari point out in their book on major transitions. So wonderful as the Sims world is, as a demo of a simple, simple, simple form of natural selection and its power, it's not a very good model because it doesn't have unlimited heredity. And Eva used this idea to introduce a very powerfully related concept that she calls unlimited associative learning. Now this is a wonderful talent and it's shared by only a few extant species and only an approximation. What are the ingredients? Well, compound stimuli and actions, novel compounds and problems as a kind of generativity to the informational system, which can then support second order conditioning or reflection. And this has the effect of opening up the architecture of the nervous system of such a creature to a huge set of potential learning opportunities. Not infinite, but vast simply because of the combinatoriality, because of the generativity. This also creates problems for the organism. In other words, organisms that can do this have made a large investment in versatility. That is to say, evolution has made a large investment. They're just the beneficiaries of this investment, but it comes with all the uh, uh, risks and benefits there, there too. Let me pause here because uh, on this occasion we're talking about animal consciousness and I don't want people to uh, forget that I myself think that human consciousness is so much more versatile and open-ended than any animal consciousness that it's almost misleading to put them by the same, call them by the same word. Um, I have said that human consciousness is to animal consciousness roughly as human language is to birdsong. Birdsong is wonderful, but there's a whole lot of things you can't do in birdsong that you can do in human consciousness or in language. Okay. This open-endedness of reflection and evaluation in, in Peter Godfrey Smith's uh, spiders and wasps, he gave us this lovely example uh, of the, the, sp the wasps, which basically have very voluminous and potent input per per perception capabilities and a sort of rigid, fixed, robotic, he even said, uh, evaluation on the basis of that versus the spiders, which he said were sort of the opposite. And it's that open-endedness in those organisms that are conscious that I think, I think we need this account in order to explain why, why suffering matters and why consciousness matters. So that in a, in a very short, in a nutshell, is how the easy problem uh, that I, the easy problems that I address uh, answer the question of why consciousness is so wonderful and why suffering matters. In short, negative valence must be functional. If it isn't functional, there's no sense to the term that it's negative. It has got to be playing a negating role of some kind. It, it can't be intrinsically negative. It has to be negative functionally in some system. In other words, ouch can't be ouch all by itself. 
It is only within a larger context where you ask and answer the hard question, and then what happens, that you can make sense of ouch at all, or that ouch can even be ouch. A nociceptor that fires is not ouch. A nociceptor that fires that then has sequelae of a certain sort, that's what you need to make ouch into ouch. Now we agreed that nociceptors without an appropriate response would be useless and would not be selected for. The simplest appropriate response is withdrawal, and that is not suffering. Lovely example of the box jellies. They have, a, they have nociceptors of sorts. They have a local and non-proliferating and non-transmitted effects, and those just aren't <coughs> enough. That's not enough for ouch. In other words, when you ask the question, and then what happens, the answer is nothing. That's why it's not ouch. A question that never got raised yesterday was whether there could be unconscious suffering. I'm just curious to know, how many here think there could be unconscious suffering? And not a, maybe 15% maybe or so. Uh, this isn't unconscious damage. This isn't unconscious thought, and this is unconscious suffering. I think the relationship between suffering and consciousness is really quite strong. Uh, as Andy pointed out, bees have a much more complex response to noxious stimuli than, for instance, box jellies do, or than many other insects do. Why? Because they have control systems that deal with a more variable and complex selective environment in which they have to have the capacity, among others, to overcome the urge to withdraw. These more complex responses to nociception matter in a way mere withdrawal doesn't. The complexity of an autonomous, self-protecting, self-advancing, but mortal, vulnerable bit of machinery gives us an explanation of why it is equipped to suffer and why its suffering matters to it. To meet the demand for an explanation of what suffering is, you have to ask and answer the hard question. And then <coughs> what happens? Suffering matters because it is the price paid by a uniquely talented by uniquely talented autonomous protectors of their own interests who pay for this power with their susceptibility to negative states that interrupt, thwart, disrupt and the otherwise smooth operation of their life projects. A pain that doesn't interrupt or interfere is not a pain and it is certainly not suffering. Suffering matters. But what else matters? Somebody mentioned an amazing suggestion from Cora Diamond about how uh, it would be wrong to eat amputated human limbs. And you want to know, well, why exactly would that be wrong? Uh, if suffering is the only touchstone of mattering, then there is nothing wrong with anencephalic cows raised for meat. They won't suffer, right? Maybe in the near future we can have beef in a box. And I understood Peter Singer to endorse this <laughs> and say that beef in a box is just fine because there's no suffering involved. Question, is there something, however, objectionable? I won't say distasteful, it would probably be delicious, but, <laughs> but is there, something, is there something objectionable about this? Well, I'll leave you to think about that, but I want to give Peter Singer a harder case. Brain dead but living human beings used as marionettes. They wouldn't be suffering. Just imagine, on a stage, brain dead human beings dancing and cavorting in all sorts of funny costumes, they wouldn't be suffering. But that would be pretty terrible. Why? Because it would violate our sense of decency. That sounds rather tame, but I think we, that's just a tame way of putting a point that might be quite strong. While we're at it, what about plants? I got thinking about what would, the, what would, what would be the analogous uh, 
outrages in plant world. And pollarding occurred to me, very unnatural. Pollard that tree, the tree doesn't care. Espaliered fruit trees, very unnatural. I wonder, are there people here who think there's a moral objection to doing this to trees? Yeah, I thought there'd be a few. <laughs> <laughs> or, or if you want to really humiliate a plant, how about topia? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if dressing a brain dead person up as a clown and, and having it be a marionette on the stage would be <laughs> grotesque, then maybe this, maybe we should outlaw this, or at least maybe we should reconsider it. But the plants don't care. And Michelangelo's Pietà doesn't care if you bash it with a hammer. And the flag doesn't care if you spit on it. But some people care. And we care that they care. And that, I think, is the extension of our moral considerations beyond suffering. Now, consciousness is not all or nothing. Uh, I'm going to end with a line that Peter Godfrey Smith said at the outset, which I want to endorse, and that is, a true gradualism is hard to think about, but it makes sense. Thank you. Okay, just a bit about how this is going to work. Um, most of the presentations are five minutes. Dan got a bit of extra time because he's Dan. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions after, uh, maybe one question after most of the presentations, maybe two, one or two after, um, after this one. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. But if you've got uh, one or two for Dan, what do you know? Ned has a question. <laughs> so Dan, you Surprise. skip, you, you, say, you say the hard question is, and what happens next? But when you're thinking about the abilities that are at least indicative of consciousness, that there is a real difference between the abilities that, sig that can exist in unconscious um, uh, mentality, which we, we know that there's all kinds of unconscious perception and unconscious, uh, um, unconsciously guided action, and the abilities that um, require consciousness. And this is a, a major object of investigation. You know, people thought that, for example, a no-go signal uh, only required, required consciousness. Then it turned out it didn't. So that's the difficult problem, is to figure out which abilities at least indicate conscious, I, consciousness. I don't think they can constitute consciousness, but they at least indicate it. Well, you're, you're looking, again, in the wrong place. You're looking at uh, the path up to consciousness. Uh, the go-no-go -no -go signals, I discuss that myself often, uh, and it's a, it's a good mark. But it's only a good mark because we know what the sequelae of, of the cases are. I, I don't know if I should describe one of these experiments. Um, uh, one of my favorites is the Debner and, and Jacobi experiment where you have a, um, this is a uh, word stem completion task. You get something like FRI, uh, and then you have to, all right, suppose I flat up FRI, oh, a word that begins with FRI. Quick, say one. Okay, you all said a word, good. Now, uh, the next time when you see a word, suppose I tell you, uh, oh, now I'm going to show you a word that actually completes the stem. Then I'm going to show you the stem, and I'm going to tell you, don't say the word that you saw first. Say some other word. Well, if I show you the word and you're conscious of it, then you can very clearly follow the directions and you'll say something else. If the word was frigid, you will say Friday or you, you'll say friend and, uh, uh, instead of frigid or whatever. But if that first uh, primed word, priming word is masked, then not only can you not follow the instructions, you will, almost, you will very likely say the very word you weren't supposed to say with a much higher probability. And what's very elegant about the experiment is the, the only thing that's changed is the, is the, is the, uh, uh, the latency of the, of the mask. If you, if you delay the latency of the mask for a few milliseconds, then nobody can 
can be can say another word because they've they've actually seen the word that was priming. If you just move that back a few milliseconds, then uh, the people don't respond to it. That's the kind of case I think that, that Ned is talking about. And they show something important. But the important thing is to look at what happens next. How are we, why do we know that the person saw the poorly masked prime? Because not only does he choose the word, but he says, I saw the word. And can go on and talk about it and why he's sure he saw it. And so there's a whole lot of sequelae that aren't there in the other case. OK, maybe time for one more. At the back. Thank you. Um, you uh, mentioned at the end of your talk about um, suffering and about how suffering isn't the only thing that matters. And you said that the reason that it's wrong to spit on a flag, for instance, is that because people care about that. Isn't that just deferring to their suffering? It's deferring to their caring. Whether that counts as suffering is another matter. But the main, the main point I wanted to make is that it is quite possible to uh, be concerned for the treatment of people, animals, plants, corpses, not because treating them one way or another is going to cause them suffering, but because treating them one way or another will somehow coarsen our society, will coarsen the way we live, will will change the ambient set of in, of expectations that people have about how we should conduct ourselves. And I think that is not illuminated by talking about that as deferred suffering. Uh, aren't those both just kind of, they're both just trying to define what's good and what's bad without having, we, we just don't have a scientific description of what good and bad are. So isn't that, aren't they both just trying to do the same thing? Well, in a sense, of course they are. Uh, but I wasn't trying to give a scientific definition of good and bad. I was trying to point out what a society considers relevant to the judgments that a society makes about what's good and bad and suggest that it wasn't all just diminish, uh, uh, the, the minimization of suffering. Okay, we'll have plenty of time to talk more about this soon, but thanks very much, Dan. Great. So our next panelist is uh, Stephen Hanad. Um, Stephen will be known to many of you as the editor of the journal Animal Sentience, which I think was just founded uh, in, in the last year or two. Um, all kinds of marvelous stuff in that online journal. I recommend going and checking it out if you haven't already. It's modeled on uh, the journal Behavioral and, Bra Behavioral and Brain Sciences that Stephen um, edited for, for decades. Uh, since the uh, the 70s or so, published all kinds of very influential work. Stephen's done a lot of work on consciousness and cognition in humans, in machines, and in animals, and is terrifically uh, positioned to give us some interesting comments here. So please welcome Stephen. There's lots of things that... Um, <clears throat> were said uh, during the last day and a half that I could talk about and I had planned to, but something fortuitous happened. This morning I received an email from somebody who had been watching this conference on uh, closed circuit TV from remotely. He's a distinguished cognitive scientist whom I won't name because what I'm going to do is quote what his critique was and then reply to it. it he, he covers some of the territory I would have covered anyway. So what this person said was, uh, the last thing in his mind was, uh, was the panel at the end of the day, but he was sorry about the whole day. Infuriating panel. I have a question for Marion Dawkins, and maybe for you, Stephen. What does she do when a mosquito lands on her arm? A wasp. When a rat chews through the basket in her garage and eats her expensive heritage seeds for next year's garden? when a deer eats all her greens, when a coyote kills her pet cat. 
And now my reply to this anonymous cognitive scientist. Your question is not for Marion Dawkins, who is a steady, unconfrontational welfareist focused on reducing some of the suffering of the victims of animal production by trying to appeal to its possible benefits for the producers and consumers rather than for the victims. That's why Marion says she's not trying to claim animals are or are not conscious, because that approach is unconvincing to skeptics, and it has not led, by Marion's lights, to much progress in improving animals' lot, either in production or in the wild. Marion attributes this to the problem of trying and failing to solve, to the satisfaction of consciousness skeptics, what has been dubbed the hard problem of consciousness. But what Marion really meant was solving the other minds problem to the satisfaction of other minds skeptics. Now, although Dave Chalmers did baptize the hard problem, giving it a name, he did not, of course, invent the problem. And his own comment that Marion was right to cite the hard problem because the other minds problem, in fact, follows from the hard problem was just Dave's opinion. And in my opinion, this is easy, my opinion, this is easily shown to be wrong. Because even if we had a highly reliable cerebroscope for dis diagnosing which organisms are insentient and when, which would solve Marion's problem, the hard problem of, ex of explaining causally how and why biological tissue generates feeling rather than just generating function would still remain unsolved and would still remain hard. I haven't even seen you shake your head yet, so you're agreeing. Okay. The hard problem is neither an ethical problem nor an animal welfare problem. It is a problem of causal explanation. The problem for ethics, no, but I'm going to leave this topic now. The problem for ethics and welfare is the other minds problem. And solving it by determining which organisms are sentient and when would not solve the ethical welfare problem because you still have to convince people that causing animal suffering matters and needs to be acted upon. My own answer to the question you raise, I'm still speaking to my interlocutor, about mosquitoes and about wasps, it came up here during the conferences, the question about cockroaches and bed bugs. My own answer to this was that while there is an elephant in the room, the monstrous suffering inflicted on animals needlessly for food for fur and for fun, there is no need to fret about cockroaches and bed bugs or about being attacked by a predator. In a vital conflict of interest between sentient organisms where life or death or health is at stake, every member of every species can and should protect its own vital life, death, and health interests. That's not the issue. The cockroach the cockroach bed bug predator objection is hence just a deflectionary, rather like Trump's uh, responses to criticism, it's just deflectionary. It's just an attempt to deflect the plea to stop hurting animals needlessly for food, fur, and fun, and to start in the, uh, and, and, and the plea to start in the comfortable Western consumer societies where every living, healthy vegan like myself at 72 is ref irrefutable evidence of the fact that the horrors are not necessary. The horrors are not necessary. They're not based on life, death, health needs for humans. So forget about the cockroach bed bug predator objection. Philosophers would call it sophistry. Now, another comment for an inter interlocutor, worse than the bed bugs. The whole discussion is focused entirely on weird people a lot of the world is not weird, he said. You mean the lady who was distributing the pamphlets? She is good-hearted and shell-shocked by the unending horrors rather than a philosopher or a scientist. Are you here? Yeah. <laughs> My own hope is that the majority of human beings are potentially decent, like her rather than self-interested sociopaths bent only on holding onto their food, fur, fun perks with otios objections, oblivious to the real ongoing cost in needless suffering, no need for a definition of it, to their animal victims, come what may. I might add that non-human animals' only hope is that most human beings, thanks to their mammalian heritage, 
with its evolved Darwinian empathy and compassion for their own young, their kin, and their kind, supplemented by the cognitive and cultural capacity to learn to do the right thing by inhibiting and outlawing portions of their likewise Darwinian legacy, such as infanticide, homicide, rape, inhibiting and outlaw, excuse me, yes, and, and rape, s uh, slavery, subjugation, and torture. The hope that we have evolved the eyes and the hearts that can be open to the unspeakable agony, agony that we are inflicting on other species on a mounting, monstrous scale. If we are not potentially merciful in the face of the overwhelming evidence, which only ag-gag laws are currently concealing from our eyes and our hearts. If we are not per per potentially merciful in the face of that evidence, if we are instead die-hard deplorables, clinging to our own orgasms, regardless of their cost in others' agony, then of course the animals are lost, and the animal cause is hopeless. And that would perhaps have been the case of human beings with their cognitive and linguistic capacities, instead of having been descendants along the mammalian line, had descended instead along the cold-blooded reptilian line from their last common ancestor with Donald Trump, who, res <laughs> who restored, the, uh, Donald Trump restored the right to import, import the trophies from elephant hunts a few days ago, but has just been forced by the protests from decent mammalians to freeze his order. I'm just about done. I, I can't seem to get my, my screen to come down. Sorry, just a second. There we are. Um, that's it. Uh, let me add that the other minds problem in this context is not an abstract problem of philosophers pondering epistemic uncertainties, as we are doing, unfortunately, in much of this conference. The other minds problem is not our problem. It is the problem of the other minds, the ones that are feeling the agony, while Descartes, Wizard of Oz-like, urges everyone to pay no attention to their screaming and struggles, they're just reflex robots acting as if they're acting as if they're feeling pain, but in reality, just nocicepting without feeling a thing. Dan at this point would of course say, no, it's not just nocicepting. There are, and then what happens? But it, but it turns out that what happens is more stuff that you see. That's not what it's about. Last quote from my interlocutor. Singer is bored to death and ignores questions from the floor because he's on his laptop. <laughs> Since he wrote his book, Animal Liberation, in 1975, Peter Singer has done the most that any human being to date has ever done, especially as quantified by utilitarian calculations, to awaken the potential for human decency and to spur action in generations of human beings. Although I cannot agree with Peter Singer on everything, utilitarianism is an, is a, utilitarianism is an appeal to the head uh, pardon me, is an appeal to just the head or a computer rather than the heart. I think that what is misperceived as boredom on Peter's part is just the difference between the cerebral and the visceral approach, dare one call it the sentient approach, to safeguarding sentience. Thank you. Oh, by the way, the, the, the power... The, the PowerPoint I was going to present is about a, a, about a conference we're going to have in June on the other minds problem and sentience, but I'll put that on a little bit later. Do I get one question? Sure. So I just want, just want to comment on the roach problem. So you present it as if it was a conflict of vital interests, but, you know, and oh, this, also the mosquitoes, but the mosquitoes aren't going to kill us. Yeah, Neither okay. were the roaches. Tell me. And so it's, it's, it's us killing the mosquitoes and killing the roaches versus, you know, our sort of just getting bitten. So I have a question for you because you look yeah. pretty decent <laughs> to me. Pretty decent to me. What is the purpose of that question? It, wait a minute. Is it to cast some doubt on the fact that the first priority is to, stop, is to deal with the elephant in the room and not worry about roaches? Are you suggesting that's not the case? No, no, no. I mean, the whole point is to say that, look, you get into uh, once you, so I'm prepared to accept that uh, suffering goes all the way down. Like, if you have no susceptors, you can suffer, right? And so, but then you face this reductio that if that's true, then 
cockroaches, uh, mosquitoes, et cetera, et cetera, can all suffer, right? And so now you've, you're faced, you know, if you're utilitarian, et cetera, et cetera, then you got to, like, you know, it's you uh, sort of uh, getting bitten versus their lives. And that's a huge, I mean, they, they will die if you kill them, the right? Elephant in the, <laughs> the elephant in the room is dying and screaming everywhere we are. You want to talk about roaches. Uh, that, anyways. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, let's get all of our panelists up on stage now, because I think uh, the remaining presentations won't be using PowerPoint. So, Alexandra, Jennifer, and David, and our um, next comment is going to be by Alexandra Horowitz, who uh, teaches at Barnard University, where she uh, runs the Dognition, sorry, the, yeah, the Dog Cognition Lab. Uh, <laughs> Also the author of a number of marvelous books, uh, Being a Dog, Inside of a Dog, all about you know, what it's like to be a dog, as well as one called uh, On Looking, uh, Walker's Guide to the Art of Observation. So, Alexander. Thank you. I am a, a cognitive ethologist. Um, as Dave says, can you hear me here? No. Can you hear me uh, now? I, it has to be like this? Yeah. How about this? All right. Okay. Uh, and I study the behavior of dogs and try to make inferences to what they might know or understand. And so I really come here as, as an observer um, and an agnostic observer, I think. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I observed. I mean, I, I did observe a lot of human-animal behavior, um, as a matter of fact, but I'll save my an analysis of that for another time. Since I study dogs, I'm very alert to uh, the ways that dogs are mentioned. Um, and dogs are mentioned quite a lot, actually, but mostly, ex with uh, Brian accepted, in their interstices between um, otherwise kind of rigorous arguments. Um, dogs or um, Peter Singer's aunts uh, walking across his apartment um, are mentioned, and at these moments, it feels like we bring a kind of uncritical attention to these animals, um, because they're around us or they affect us in a certain kind of way. And suddenly, we're going by intuition. We're prone to paying more attention when, when we think there's some kind of complexity. So dogs, everybody will say, oh, certainly do have it, and ants, at least we hope, do not. In, in my profession, I run across this kind of intuition making all the time because I study dogs. I'm square in the middle of the dog and the owner and the owner making all sorts of attributions, anthropomorphisms we tend to call them, about the dog's mental state. One of the reasons I think that dogs weren't scientifically studied for such a long time in, in cognition research was that we already had a pretty rich vocabulary about what it's like to be a dog, about what dogs know and understand, right? I mean, we must because they're in our beds. So we hope we do. <laughs> And yet, if you poke a little at those attributions, of course they give. And in fact, you know, I did a study about the guilty look of dogs, that you know that look, right? <laughs> um, where dogs have got perhaps gotten into your trash bin when you've been out. Um, and through a really simple study where um, I had uh, owners forbid dogs to have a treat, uh, and then the owners lead the room, and, and I kind of manipulate whether the dog can have the treat or not, and then when the owner returns, we see what happens. What you see is that dogs, you can't say anything from their behavior about dogs' guilt, right, or guiltlessness, despite our wanting to. Um, instead, you can say something pretty interesting, though, about their sensitivity to and perception of our movements and our behavior, and even our behavior before we might be aware of our behavior, right? And that might be even more interesting than whether they have guilt or, say, consciousness, this other thing about the dog. So I want to make just two quick general points as a, as a behavioral scientist um, overall. My observation is that science is treated a little uncritically in this context you know, by non-scientists. In other words, I feel very self-critical of how science happens, of the process of science, of why we're asking the questions we are and answering them in the ways we are, and the limitations, importantly, the limitations to the kinds of conclusions that we can make. But there's all sorts of appeals to a kind of evidence and lots of calls for more results needed. 
And that worries me a little bit, and especially you know, a great love of, of neuroscience, where it's been said we have very provisional grip on what's going on, and certainly any possible mental uh, neural correlates. That said, you know, there is this nice feedback loop that I also observe where philosophers are developing or proposing concepts and then scientists run to kind of chase them down and then the data is, are used by the philosophers to kind of reify or evolve their concepts. And in fact, the history of my own research is very much like that. You know, I, I specifically remember the page in Colin Allen and Mark Beckhoff's Species of Mind where they talked about um, how a play bow of a dog might indicate something about its understanding of others' mental states. And I specifically researched that problem using Dan Dennett's idea of intentional stance directly. And then the rest of my career, interested in what it's like to be a dog, um, obviously Thomas Nagel has a professional responsibility for how I've spent my life. Um, <laughs> So I want to say that in some ways where it feels like there's some equivocation or concepts are, are muddled or we don't, we're disagreeing about what we're actually talking about, actually those moments are somewhat useful. You know, I feel like I'm going to take those back and try to work on them and poke them. And one of the motifs, for instance, that I noticed a lot here um, was something interesting because this is very analytic discourse that we've been engaged in. But repeatedly the nature of our experience of time was invoked. Um, and not only whether the speaker had the same experience of time as the audience, surely not. Um, <laughs> instead, instead of being you know, a structure that comes on and off, consciousness was kind of implied in this feeling, this sort of impressionistic um, component of time. Um, and, and Peter Singer referenced that explicitly with the, with the example of the time scale of the gnat beating a wing and how I think about how maybe a moment for a dog who has a higher flicker fusion rate than, than we might be different than our moments. And so I'm going to take that back and think about how, um, what it's like to be a dog, which is, by the way, very smelly, I believe, is partially ch their experience of time is changed by considering olfaction. So, for instance, the past is represented in smells that have fallen to the ground by animals who have passed by earlier, and the future is represented um, in smells on the breeze. And I think I'll stop there. Is there a question? Hey there. Uh, so my boyfriend and I actually saw you uh, last year at the Secret Science Club when you spoke about dogs, and we were kind of so inspired by what we heard that we tried to teach my dog how to count, and uh, that was really interesting. Um, the barking didn't work, <laughs> um, but we have been trying with uh, trying to teach him how to show us with his paws. So if we hold up like four fingers, if he gives it to us four times. Now, the big problem that we keep asking ourselves is, how do we know that he actually knows that this is, I need to give my owner four paws instead of, let me just keep giving her my paw and see if she gives me the treat? Real great question, and I'm glad you're, you're playing with your dog, basically. Um, <laughs> the, I don't think that you do know that, right? I mean, what the thing is that is learned is part of the question that's kind of being asked and was also asked by by Joe, what's, d are we learning maybe some of the f idea that it's fear? Are we learning that this is counting that we're doing? And especially in that, if you haven't, um, if you don't give them the flexibility to show that they can do that type of thing with an arbitrary novel number, then they've just, um, they have just tried the thing that works and they might have memorized the thing that works. Um, you know, but you could design a more controlled experiment around that. And look at what the dog, what's important in the dog's life that, uh, for which it would need uh, a concept of number or counting. 
and start there instead of putting our ideas of what, of how we should count, which is sort of you know f counting on fingers and working from there up. Then you might be tapping into something that the dog naturally does, and that is their concept of counting potentially. Okay, thanks. Okay, our next comment will be from Jennifer Jaquette. Uh, Jennifer is on the, uh, the Faculty of Environmental Studies here at NYU, as well as being affiliated particularly with Animal Studies and the Stern Business School and Data Sciences. Uh, Jennifer works especially on large-scale cooperative dilemmas as they uh, arise in issues like climate change um, and the exploitation of wild animals, including fish, and is really interested in the role of social approval and shame and guilt uh, in that context. Wrote a really interesting book, came out a couple of years ago, it's called Is Shame Necessary? that I recommend to you all. So, Jennifer. Thank you. And thanks for organizing this um, meeting of the minds. I, um, to masquerade among philosophers, I've actually written my talk, which I never do. Um, uh, and as uh, Dave mentioned, I'm interested in animals, most especially wild animals and especially aquatic animals and fish and fisheries is my main uh, animal interest. And as I think Peter Singer mentioned yesterday, there's a lot at stake for these animals. Um, they're the last wild animals hunted at a global scale for food. Uh, there are at least one trillion, that's a very conservative estimate of individual fish killed each year, and that's to say nothing of the invertebrates. And then the, there's the additional billion animals um, killed in fish farming. And again, this data though is, is really rough. Um, that's, a, that's a kind of bottom estimation because fish in general are not spoken about in terms of individuals. They're not even spoken about as fish. They're often referred to as seafood. So fish are truly forgotten. They're not reported in the farmed animal statistics. They aren't spoken about as individual species, which we've heard many times also in the pain panel. And again, almost never as individual animals. And as we can see from this very conference, there are still doubts among some people about their ability to feel pain. And that's because, not surprisingly, aquatic animals, particularly the non-mammals, have traditionally ranked very low on our radar of what matters. They ranked low on the great chain of being, and they rank low in terms of legal status, and they are low ranking um, by religions that demand that their adherents ascribe to meat-free days, but they allow fish on those days. And some of you might even be familiar with the, um, the fish-eating vegetarian. So what I find very interesting about the work on consciousness and sentience and pain is when it can elevate an animal that might otherwise have continued to occupy a low rung on the ladder of morality. The octopus serves as an interesting example of how science and philosophy might help elevate the moral status of an animal or of a group of animals. We have already heard about the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness in 2012 that included octopus as the only invertebrates and about how there's even an, an ecology to consciousness, um, which Ava brought up in her talk, um, in terms of the kinds of problems octopus face by predators and as prey. Writers have argued against eating octopus in The Guardian and in The New Yorker, and in making their arguments, they cite their, the work on octopus intelligence and on sentience. Just this summer, PETA volunteers actually protested at a restaurant in Queens that serves octopus alive. So in these moments, uh, I can imagine many of us are very pleased with people like Peter Godfrey Smith and David Edelman. Yet, not a single species of octopus is protected under the Convention for International Trade in Endangered Species, the most powerful international legal regime we have for protecting wild animals. You know who is on the list? A great number of species of coral. These invertebrates are in that consciousness challenge phylum, Nideria. They have no centralized nervous system, and coral reefs are even described as the forests of the sea. Some of you might speculate that's because CITES does not, uh, that CITES does not protect octopus because they're not endangered. The truth is that even if some species of octopus are endangered, just as Atlantic bluefin tuna are endangered under absolutely any measurement, and Patagonian toothfish are endangered, there are no aquatic animal species that are commercially traded for food on the convention. Calamari trumps consciousness. So while the presence of consciousness might encourage some moral deliberation about an animal, as we know, it in no way ensures it. 
And at the same time, we value and protect many things with no consciousness, as Dan Dennett pointed out. We protect and value corals, stone arches, grand canyons, cave drawings, the moon. This year, New Zealand and India granted rivers in their countries legal personhood status. My view is that, is that if humans discover they are degrading something, sentient or not, they have an obligation to try to fix it. While I take Victoria Braithwaite's and Marion Dawkins' point that the scientific work has helped contribute to improvements in the lives of animals, and this is clearly true of their own work and the other scientists at this conference, there is no doubt that on balance, the null hypothesis and the placement of the burden of proof has worked against animals and other living species. In terms of academic work, it is difficult to point to anything that has mattered more to animals in general than a work of philosophy, Animal Liberation, published in 1975. And while I agree with Peter Singer in 2017 that conscious beings deserve a special kind of moral consideration, I'm arguing that the relationship between consciousness and our consciences is not as clear as we might assume. Moral status and our moral obligations might not rest very heavily on the question of consciousness. Thank you. The very last thing you said, could you just say a bit more on the positive side? So if it, what does it depend on over and above consciousness? What, what's your positive position there? I think that the, I guess the expanding moral umbrella or whatever it is, is um, it just seems to me that it expands for a whole variety of reasons. It's not even clear to me, for instance, that the cephalopods have been granted this kind of elevated status because of consciousness. I think, um, you know, there, I think that's an area I think Brian Hare was talking about uh, that we could empirically research, but it seems to me that uh, like people, there was this great article in the New York Times, right, about friendship in animals, that now we're willing to talk about friendship in animals just because we've all observed it on YouTube, on YouTube basically. And so I think the question of, of what does that, it can be exposure to the animal, it can be the culture in which you grow up, it could be some top-down pressure, right, like Meatless Mondays introduced by the New York City <laughs> government recently. Um, but all I'm saying is, I guess I don't think that consciousness is really the the thing upon which we should rest all of our our moral hopes. Okay, thanks. Okay, our final comment will be from David Edelman. Uh, David is a neuroscientist at the University of San Diego, also has a uh, affiliation with Brooklyn College here in New York. David's especially well known for his work on the neuroscience of the octopus, which has been pretty well this, the star of this conference, species-wise. Um, um, David special, has specialized in the study of visual perception um, in the octopus, and also has connected this uh, quite richly to issues about consciousness, its evolution, and theories of consciousness in neuroscience. He also organized a great meeting of the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness just a, a few years ago. So please welcome David. Thanks, and thank you to the organizers for, for this wonderful um, and very provocative meeting. Um, I wanted to start with a little addendum to what you just said, which, of course, very true. It, it's really curious that the international standards for protection of, of species don't really, they, they exclude very noticeably the cephalopods. What's really interesting is for a change, um, shockingly, the scientific community is, has sort of taken the lead in this respect in Europe. Um, what we call IACUC, the, the Standards for the Humane Care and Treatment of Animals in Laboratory Research, has taken aggressive hold in Europe, and in fact the standards are the same for octopuses as they are for rats, for rabbits, for animals with fur, for mammals, basically. You have to anesthetize, you have to do all these things, you have to, as much as you can, um, you have to moder you know, remediate pain, do all these, these various things that you do for mammals in the lab. So it's really an interesting thing. And it's more or less taking hold in the United States, just to add a somewhat encouraging note, I guess. Um, at the facility where I'm doing most of my work right now, which is at Dartmouth, actually, um, it, we have to abide by uh, all of the IACUC standards that hold for all the animals in the facility. So we've basically been future-proofed. 
Anyway, that's an aside. So before I give you my very, very short, I hope, uh, observations about the meeting and what people have said here, uh, I want to give you a little introduction, uh, a little bit more of an introduction to myself so you can glean from that um, a lens through which I see all of this. Um, my initial graduate training was in human paleontology. I set out to become a fossil guy. I was a fossil guy. I got my PhD in human paleontology. Um, my touchstone has always been, throughout my professional scientific life, evolution, evolutionary biology. Uh, and I moved from that r sort of not too quickly, unfortunately, being that it was an anthropology program and these things take time. Unfortunately, anthropology produces PhDs once every 15 <laughs> years, it seems. Mine was a land speed record. I think it only took nine years. Uh, when I got out of that, I couldn't get a job, so I moved into, eventually moved into neuroscience by way of genetics. So I learned genetics first, then I moved to neuroscience. But this gave me an interesting perspective, and the perspective was, uh, as somebody who was a quasi-outsider to benchtop science, I came in trained as an anthropologist, tra trained as a fossil guy, trained in a discipline in which analogical reasoning, and this may be a, a new phrase for some of you, for some of you may be very familiar, it's used a lot in archeology span and anthropology. Analogical reasoning is crucial in anthropology, specifically in archeology, span and even in the study of evolution. It is even crucial to the study of dinosaur paleontology. You have to do it. And what do I mean by analogical reasoning? What I mean is you have essentially the skeletal remains for the most part of animals. Sometimes you're a little luckier than that. But generally the skeletal remains, and you have to glean from the appearance of those skeletal remains and the metrics of those remains a life way for the, that particular animal. And how do you do that? You do that through comparative examination of living species and their life ways, which you can obviously study. Um, so there's a lesson here, and I think the lesson to a young science, and I do believe that consciousness science is still quite young, is that analogical reasoning has a place. All right, I, I think that there was an implicit message, some, something to that effect going on here, but nobody explicitly said it. And the point is, we consider paleontology to be a perfectly reasonable science, but that reasonable science is not completely empirical and falsifiable in the same sense that the science in which I was steeped over the past decade or so is. So I think we have to take that to heart and realize that in fact we're dealing with a sort of a hybrid here. We really don't know enough. Some people would say we don't know what consciousness is. We don't know what it is that we're trying to study. Other people like me would say, yes, we have a sort of a definition. Um, I have my own working definition. I won't go into it here. Um, and on that basis, and on the basis of a human example, and here's where the analogy comes in handy, and I'm using that term generically. I'm not using it vis-a-vis -vis analogy versus homology, okay, because there's a very distinct difference when you're talking about evolution. Um, the human case is very important, at least in, in my mind, as a reference and a, and a, a sort of a, a reference standard to which we can turn if we're looking for some little signatures or shall we say correlates, I've used the word correlates one too many times and it's now way too many times after this meeting, but if we're looking for the correlates of conscious processing, we first turn to the human case for the obvious reason that in the human case we have report, explicit verbal report, some people would argue that we can get behavioral report from non-human animals and I completely agree with that. I think sometimes we have to be very imaginative how we glean that behavioral report, but nevertheless, it's very important for us to approach it, I think, in, on these terms. We, we, we have to sort of go, we can go for what we can go for analogically to an extent in the sense that we have a very good case in front of us, it's the human case. Now, of course, once we r range beyond mammals and we range even beyond animals with backbones into the world of cephalopods, we're confronted with some very obvious problems. The anatomy is incredibly different. They are very alien-like, or at least my, in my imagination, as the best case for an alien on Earth. And so we have to really stretch ourselves, but, I hasten to say that there is evidence, in fact, not just functional evidence, not just behavioral evidence, that octopuses sort of pursue the same sorts of, of processes or have the same sorts of processes vis-a-vis -vis memory, vis-a-vis -vis some, some of the stuff that I think of as the building blocks for conscious processing. They have this behaviorally, we can see it behaviorally, we have evidence for it, but we actually also have some very 
tantalizing, the beginnings of structural evidence. Not structural evidence in a direct sense, because we can't say, ah, this neuron is, a homo is the homology of, of a cortical, a pyramidal cell. It's not, clearly isn't. But the organization of areas that handle memory in much the same way that, say, the hippocampus handles episodic or episodic-like memory in mammals, it looks like that organization in the vertical and median superior frontal lobes of the octopus brain, which in fact happen to be the lobes which, in a series of fairly horrible experiments, but informative at least, back in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, Jay Z Young discovered were pivotal to memory, long-term memory, in the octopus, visual and tactile memory. When he took pieces of that lobe out, the animals had sort of selective, increasing selective loss of memory. So I'm making this point just to illustrate the idea that I think we can go forward fairly robustly. Um, we, can, we do have to invoke to a degree this analogical reasoning, we're a young science, but I do think that there's not, there, these aren't bad words. So I think we should go forward. So I'm gonna make two quick observations and, and get off my, my high horse. Um, the first observation is I think that the evolutionary strain that definitely ran through much of yesterday and parts of today is, is fundamentally important because it sets up a context. And I'm not a, I'm not a hyper-adaptationist. I'm not a Panglossian paradigm kind of guy who believes that, you know, everything is all, it's all for a, a cause. You know, evolution shapes up everything and it's all about adaptation. I think most of it is about adaptation. I think sometimes it isn't. But that being said, um, I believe that an evolutionary touch, touchstone is critical, and I believe that, it, in general, a natural historian's approach to these kinds of problems, even for hard neuroscientists working in the vineyards of memory research, working in the vineyards of research that doesn't even have to invoke the big C. It doesn't have to invoke conscious processing. This is vitally important. It sets up a context, and I do believe it introduces something to a kind of a benchtop science that, if you'll forgive me, has the earmarks of, of having a syndrome that I would call, or somebody I know very well used to call, physics envy, okay? <laughs> and not for the right reasons. And not, I'm not talking about Stuart Hameroff, and I'm not talking about quantum physics. I'm talking about classical physics and the idea that you can pin down things, and that's it, and that's all we need, and we have to throw out the rest. I think that's a very dangerous um, foray. The final thing I'm going to say relates it to uh, the ethical question. So uh, far be it for me as an experimentalist to, to preach from on high about ethical standards. I do believe in the humane treatments of, uh, of animals. I do, I do salute everybody on the panel yesterday, in particular Marion Dawkins for her approach. It's laudable. I'm definitely in her camp in terms of a pragmatic and very proactive and tractable approach to the problem of ethics in the way we raise animals for food if we have to do this. Now, the final comment I'm going to make is from my anthropological uh, perspective as a trained anthropologist, which is one problem to speak to what Stephen said, which I do think is a glaring problem, practically speaking, and maybe even in a sense, ethically speaking, though I don't want to get into that palimpsest, is the problem of African societies in which you know, if you go to Africa, my sister did many years of field work in Africa as, as somebody involved in, in um, giving grants to women's businesses all over, all over parts of the continent. She found that, in fact, that you couldn't have a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle there. She was, in fact, when she left, she was a vegan, I believe. She couldn't be. She had to literally abandon it or, or starve. But, in fact, the question I have is how do we approach those cultures? How do we make a change fundamentally to those cultures? And I'm not being hypercritical in this sense because I'm with you in principle in this camp. Mix up your own culture first. That's fair enough, good. I, I was hoping you would have an answer and that, that's a reasonable answer. So there is a start and I, I agree with that idea. But I wanted to put that out there. Anyway, I've taken too long. Thank you very much. Okay, a question there on the aisle. Hi, this question is primarily for Stephen. No, um, I'm sorry, this is, this is a question for David right now. Oh, did, for did you have a question for David? <laughs> Does anyone, sorry, question for David. Hands up again. Take 
I think in science we're used to seeing situations where one model nests within a larger model, such as uh, uh, classical physics nesting within relativity. In the same sense, I think that the conversation we just had with the three of you nests in the larger context of the approaching mass extinction and uh, the, the probable collapse of human civilization as a component of that. Uh, and um, I, think, I think that uh, one thing that we can trace this to is that we're doing something that's causing this. And I you know, so I'd like to ask you to reflect on that and whether speciesism and um, militant physicalism uh, as a way of avoiding making personal contacts with other species could be part of this. Uh, I think so. I think um, there's, let me get my thoughts together. There's, there is a, uh, this, this fundamental issue of our position in particular, and I'm talking primarily about the people in this room. I'm talking by extension about who you represent in terms of a class, in terms of a, a subgroup in society, generally. I'm probably going to overgeneralize. But the main problem that we have is, is what I would, might, might call moral outrage fatigue and a sort of a sense of helplessness and also a sense that there's a good number of us who are so buffered from the travails and the, the, the turbulence and, and horrors of the world. We hear about it and obviously if we're, if we're mindful enough about it, we can do something about it. But in terms of our everyday lives, we're insulated from this. And I would say this in human history, this is unprecedented in a sense. Because if you go back 80 years, if you, if you look to you know, your father or your grandfather growing up in the Great Depression, and I have my own stories, my parents and my grandparents, life wasn't like this. You didn't have so many, so many sort of buffering points of separation between you and what was tearing the world apart. It may be perhaps two degrees of separation, as in your brother just shipped out or whatever, and he got killed at Normandy or whatever. Now it's a different story. And the real practical problem is, it's, it's almost educational in a sense, but it's getting, it's getting a combination of sort of a, a visceral outrage and, and educating the public together uh, in, in such a way, in an effective message that you know, brings people to the barricades, bring, you know, gets people to action. And that's really, really difficult. I don't have a solution to that, but I think it's, that is one of the most important practical problems to all of this that I see, is getting past all the chatter and also appealing to a group, a very large, but not the majority of the world, but nevertheless large and influential group in terms of money and influence, um, to do something. Because in fact, they're not feeling any of this directly. They're not feeling the pain in a direct way, even though some people they know somewhere out in Illinois, who, who whatever, may very well be. So there's this problem. We, if we don't feel pain, directly speaking of pain, it's very difficult to, to you know, force us to action. So that's, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. I, I don't have Thanks, answer. David. <laughs> OK, now we can open up to some, uh, some general discussion. Let's see who's got. Uh, why don't we start with the gentleman holding the microphone? <laughs> Uh, so this question is uh, related to Dale's question um, in the last session. So I'm one of those people who uh, thinks, maybe mistakenly, that capacity for conscious suffering uh, is of great moral importance. Maybe it's one of the primary uh, things of moral importance. Um, and that's why I think it's important to maybe sort of be more precise about any uncertainty we might have about animal consciousness, because we might want to have a precautionary principle where even if we're not totally sure about some cases, it would be better uh, to be safe than sorry. Um, I mean, I'm very curious about this with uh, the case of Stuart Derbyshire and Joe Ledoux, but I guess they're now in the audience. But so I just wanted uh, our panel to maybe give their subjective credence from one to 100, zero to 100, uh, that the following species are capable of having mental states that are unpleasant and felt uh, and of moral importance. So let's do uh, cockroaches, tuna, 
chicken and pigs? Uh, and how do you, how do you mac, uh, act on that information uh, ethically? What, what ethical significance do you think it has? Anyone? I mean, well, I'll, I'll just say something about bivalves, which I think is in the cockroach category to some degree, um, maybe even lower ranked. And uh, I think Peter Singer said yesterday, drawing the line somewhere between bivalves and shrimp was a, a good idea, and he, he maintains that that was sort of true. Um, which is, uh, my colleagues and I have advocated if we had to recreate, um, or if we have to farm aquatic animals, and we, and we don't necessarily have to do that, but we don't want to recreate the same problems that we have on land with terrestrial animals. And um, one of the ways we thought you could avoid this is if you focused on bivalve farming, because you can minimize the sort of welfare concerns, and um, in part due to the, the role of, or lack of role of consciousness. That said, you know, if you think about some of the environmental issues, dead zones or acidification, you know, with increasingly more acidic oceans due to, due to increasing amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in, and in the oceans. And, and even if you said it only affects bivalves, which is not true, it affects all calcifying organisms, including coral reefs and, and phytoplankton, but um, would you say that's okay? We should keep doing that, even though we've con we have, they, they don't have consciousness as far as we're all concerned. We have agreed that we'll have mass production of farming, and, and I would say, no, we should, we, should, we should do something about that. So, so that's where I just come back to this point where, yes, I think consciousness is important, but it's just really not the only thing that matters in so many of these dilemmas. Okay, Rob, I think you're going to have to choose one animal. Great. To get uh, the let's do chickens. Chickens. Okay, credence that chickens are conscious. Dan. <laughs> a, n a number from zero to a hundred. We're all on a hundred. Hundred, hundred. Okay, one uh, more. And do all the panelists uh, eat chickens, uh, or which ones? Well, I know. That's I'm, a bit I'm pretty sure about one of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm, I'm I'll, I'll give the mic to someone else now. You want to bring it out? Octopuses. Yes. Yes, for everyone. Okay. Um, bees. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. Consciousness okay, getting some numbers. is an all or nothing thing. Yeah. They've got some amazing yeah. properties on the scale that consciousness mm -hmm. of, in all species can be, can be loosely measured on. So, mm -hmm. yes, but not, it's not one, it's not the light is on or the light is off. Right. I'm hearing 0. 0.75. <laughs> 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 it's, Good. It's, not, uh, it's not a question of my confidence is a question of how minimal the consciousness is and whether it deserves to be called consciousness at all. Right, and, and one of the things here, which I very gingerly, I must give myself a pat on the back, avoided when I chose octopus as my model organism, you know, eight years ago, was the question of the minima well, not the minima of conscious processing, the minima of any kind of higher brain function. I totally studiously avoided the honeybee, especially after a, an interesting conversation with Christoph Koch about honeybee. He approached me and said, yeah, well, don't you think, this is ridiculous, don't you think the, honey, the honeybee looks for all the world like it's conscious? What are you going to do? So I said, okay, and I kind of rolled that around my head, and then the next year I went into octopus. Um, <laughs> and that was an easy dodge, because they've got half a billion neurons. But, you know, so I avoided this question. But, you know, I think we have to be careful about that and avoid this issue of one million versus half a billion. Uh, and really look, the, the, the value of, of the work of Andy yesterday was really identifying structures that at least functionally are doing things that we, we have some familiarity with in the vertebrate case. And that's the really important stuff, and that's what we should be shooting for. So I give the honeybee a fairly high, you know, probability. Could I have a goal? I, I'm on the other end of the table, so I'm allowed to disagree. It's an all or none thing, and the question is, does it hurt the honeybee or, bee, or doesn't it hurt the honeybee? It either does or it doesn't, and my guess is that it does. I'm hearing 0 0.75, 0 0.8. 100% hurt if true. Yeah, but, but the question was your credence, your degree of belief. Wait, if you had to bet, it would be four to one odds? <laughs> okay. How about Tom Nagel? Um, I want to ask about you know, the, the old underlying question in philosophy of mind, uh, which um, 
concerns what we're really talking about when we ask about animal consciousness. And um, I really have to ask it in the form of a question to Dan, uh, because he represents more, most explicitly on this panel one uh, view on the question. Uh, although um, Peter Carruthers uh, expressed a similar uh, view earlier. Um, in, in your remarks just now, it surfaced immediately when you said, uh, why does suffering matter? And dismissed out of hand the answer, it just does. Um, now, if you asked an ordinary human being, why does suffering matter? If he was sophisticated, he, he probably reply, you must be a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> but if he was unsophisticated, he, he would probably say, just stick your hand in a pot of boiling water and you'll understand why suffering matters. Now your position that more is required to explain why suffering matters is an, is an instance of the refusal to accept the deliverance of the first person point of view as data. Uh, please, if you want to reply. It's a refusal to treat the deliverances of the first person point of view as unchallengeable data. It's data about what, they, what their intuitions are, but that's as far as it goes. They're okay. data, they're wonderful data, but yeah. they might be wrong. Yeah, uh, well I was, I, I, mean, I was speaking in, in shorthand, I mean as not just intuitions. I mean, um, okay. Uh, I'm not committed to a general incorrigibility about what the first person point of view delivers, but that um, what you feel when you uh, stick your hand in a pot of boiling water uh, is bad and matters, um, seems to me among the things that is presented directly to experience. Now, this, there's, a, I, I, I'm sorry for the long wind up, but um, this, extends to the general uh, appropriate method of thinking about uh, consciousness and its instantiation in other creatures besides ourselves. Um, and one approach takes as the starting point, you know, allowing for possible errors and so on, uh, what is presented to us in immediate experience, and uh, of course acknowledges that in the case of other creatures, all we have to go on are is, uh, what is externally observable and func functional uh, organization, physiology, and so on, but maintains as an essential part of the subject matter, although we may be unable to reach it, um, something analogous to what is subjectively available to us, and regards this as having a, a, a feature, a logical feature really, of subjectivity, 
um, immediate accessibility only to a certain type of point of view, uh, that uh, at least seems to not be susceptible to physicalistic reduction. Now, I, anybody who holds your opposing view that essentially the story has to be part of the story about the physical spatio-temporal universe, however complicated it may be, um, has to have an explanation of why the absolutely. other view is so tempting. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Peter Carruthers ref referred, used uh, um, recognitional concepts as yep. his, and you have your version. And I asked him after the talk earlier um, what it's like for him to apply these recognitional concepts of you know, the taste of chocolate, the smell of coffee, the look of the color red. And of course, he said, it's exactly the same as it is for me. You know, it seems to him that there's this uh, immediate <coughs> property uh, to what's going on in him. But when he asks himself, as it were, from the outside, what he's really doing, he has a perfectly good uh, story which eliminates the uh, non-physical references of those concepts. And I take it you do too. Yeah. And my que after this long wind-up, my question is, by what authority do you give priority to that external story about what you're doing when you when it seems to you that you're ta you're identifying this simple quality of the the smell of coffee which is exactly the same thing that I'm doing by what authority do you give to the external description uh, a a priority which allows you to disregard the data that are coming right at you from uh, inside your own mind. Sorry for the long wind-up. I'll try to keep the response short. This is long wind-up, big pitch. Now, I'm asking, answering the question, what is it like to be at bat? <laughs> <laughs> Um, what authority? First of all, a few observations. For years, I have been quite sure that if there was a, a non-counterintuitive theory of consciousness, we would have had it a long time ago. So I think almost certainly there's something that seems damn obvious to most people. It's just false. The fact that a theory is counterintuitive is not in any area except philosophy viewed as an impediment. In the sciences, people search. They hope to find counterintuitive theories. That's the way progress is made. I think the, the stubbing of the toes of philosophers on the problem of consciousness has all the earmarks to begin with of being a case where there's something that people think is just plain obvious, which we're going to have to deny, Happily, I have my choices for what, which those counterintuitive uh, bits are, and you articulated it very well, and especially in commenting on what Peter Carruthers and you had to say. I submit, first of all, that we are all, or should be, embarrassed when we look inside, when we go introspective, we find out we have almost nothing to say about how we tell the smell of coffee from the, from the taste of chocolate or, or any of these other things. We just do. And in our embarrassment, we treat our inexplicable capacity to answer questions, even questions that we silently pose to ourselves, satisfy our own inner curiosity and so forth. We, we notice that we can do this and we dream up theories about how this involves 
direct apperception of special properties such as qualia and so forth. And that's all just theory. And that has no more authority than any other desperate theory that anybody comes up with. What has authority is the fact that we are able to say a lot and do a lot and reflect a lot and remember a lot of the contents that run through our brains. How we do it and what the, what the, what the uh, medium is in which this happens, we are basically clueless about. Science tells us that the medium is nerve impulses, and neural spike trains and the like. We don't have any access to that. <coughs> if I ask you to uh, 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 conjure up some, you know, if I ask you to imagine a, a bright letter, a bright red letter A on a black background, you can do it. If I ask you how you do it, you have the faintest idea how you do it. You just know you do it and you can answer questions about it. You have no uh, authority at all about how you do it or w what the medium is. And that's for science to discover. Now the reason, one, one, just one more point on this, uh, about the authority. The reason that I am trusting science more than the personal level, everyday manifest image view of things is that we have these puzzles. These are the same kind of puzzles that have driven science all along. Uh, back in Aristotle's day, people wondered about magnets and siphons and uh, gyroscopes and all sorts of things which didn't make much sense to them and they developed science around it. Today, we wonder about you know, whether trees can feel um, and the very questions that have just been raised about, well, what about octopuses and, can, and can, uh, uh, could a robot ever be conscious and so forth. The only way we will ever answer that is if we develop a scientific theory. And the scientific theories that we develop are extremely uh, responsive to evidence from all all corners, including the, the, the wealth of evidence that you're citing. That's what I call heterophenomenology. It is taking the first person point of view seriously from the third person point of view. It is the most seriously you can take first person uh, uh, data. Uh, I mean, it's designed to be the exhaustive and sympathetic and open-minded analysis of the data that we all enjoy in our daily life about our own consciousness. That's where we start. Okay, I would like, I'd to, I'd give like, to, get more I'd like to give an example of a quick pitch rather than a slow pitch. The question is not the way you formulate it. The question for a, 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 an ordinary person is, there are organisms in, on the planet, Darwinian organisms. Some of them feel and some of them don't. Those that feel, how and why do they feel? I answered that. <laughs> OK, uh, we have a lot of questions. How about Jeff? And let's try and speed it up a bit to get a few in. Great. <laughs> OK, thanks. So uh, one, one of the issues that has come up, of course, is uh, which creatures are conscious, which creatures experience pain. Another that has come up along the way is how should we use the concepts or terms like consciousness or pain, so often people seem to disagree about whether or not a particular animal is conscious or experiences pain, and then it emerges that we all agree that, that humans and non-humans are similar in some respects and different in others, and I prefer to use consciousness and pain narrowly in a way that uh, uh, amplifies the, the differences, and you prefer to use it widely in a way that amplifies the similarities. So I was wondering if you could address how we should go about thinking about how to make that particular choice. Uh, is it entirely a theoretical matter? Is it also a practical matter? If it is a practical matter, what kinds of considerations are relevant? If, if everyone in society seems to be anthropomorphizing too much, does that mean that we should use it more narrowly to emphasize the difference, or vice versa if people are too uh, anthropocentric? Um, if people are abusing animals, does that mean that we should err on the side of using it more widely, et cetera, et cetera? What kinds of considerations, when we all agree that there are similarities and differences, should determine where we draw the line conceptually or linguistically? 
anybody who wants to answer it. I do want to say that um, that's a great question. I won't quite answer it, but let me hit say this. You know, if we if what we're interested in is a human-like consciousness, I think we already know the answer to that. I mean, the, the, uh, intuition and science kind of bear out. Maybe we have homologous structures. Maybe there are similarities. Maybe behaviorally we see recognizable components. But fundamentally, if we're going to um, try to create a policy um, based on this, we already know that we're giving ourselves priority. I mean, I might be interested in actually un trying to undermine some of the attributions that we make to humans. Um, that's one possibility, but I would say if we're not gonna do that, and we are acknowledging that there's a, s there's a special thing that we have, and we're just looking for it somewhere else, <coughs> that we're not gonna find it exactly, we already know that, so why don't we look exactly at what we have? and a little bit deflect the question of whether it's exactly like. It's the thing it is that is, you know, and in fact, we're not really looking very much. The number of organisms, this is usually brought up, I think, in, in this type of discussion, but I don't think it has been here, that we've looked at is extremely minute. And most of our sense of whether an animal has consciousness or, no, or not is based on the fact that we know almost nothing about its behavior or life. And the more we know that the more we grow interested in it as an animal, qua, qua its anim itself in its life. So I would, rather, I would defer to just finding what the animal's amb functions and goals and ambitions and life cycle are like and put aside the question of, of consciousness if we're interested in a welfare in, in policy. Okay, let's take another one from Colin. So, uh, so I, I want to ask the panelists to use their awesome human powers of prognostication. But let me frame it by saying I think 20 years ago, if you'd taken the temperature of a room such as this, it would be much colder on animal consciousness. And here we are, much warmer on it. But there, are, of course, is still a distribution, and there are still people in the cold part of the distribution, and some people who are impatient that things aren't going fast enough on the other end. <laughs> About 10 years ago, I had a chance to ask Donald Griffin whose name surprisingly hasn't come up at all in the last two days, um, why he wrote such ridiculous things in his book, The Question of Animal Awareness, which, by the way, has been extremely influential in getting lots of people into animal behavior careers. Lots of people tell me, oh, I read those books, and I, that's what I wanted to do. And they're now doing very ordinary sort of lizard mating display kinds of, I mean, it's fun stuff, but it's not <laughs> consciousness, right? But, but, the, uh, but I asked him why he said such ridiculous things as, well, bees might need consciousness more than people because they have so few neurons, right? A sort of very anti-neural view of things. And he said, well, look where we are today compared to where we were then. And I'm still way out here. But if I'd taken the position where we are today, we would still be back there. So what I want to ask the panel is whether you think we're having a moment sort of peak animal consciousness. And we're going to sort of, in another 10 years, go, oh, well, we kind of tried that, didn't get very far. Or do you see anything at all from the last two days which gives you some sort of confidence that the pendulum is going to keep swinging that way or the distribution. So what is the direction of the pendulum? Yes. And what is the what, Oh, oh, towards more and more recognition that is going to be then a scientific consensus. More interest in animal consciousness or more animals being recognized as well, conscious? Well, I think interest goes along with recognition as well. So so if if the recognition isn't there, people will lose interest, right? My own sense is that we're going to get more and more recognition of animal consciousness and Joe Ledoux is going to get madder and madder. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that, 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 that gap is going to be the growing one. I'd like to point out something that uh, it, some of you may not realize, is that complicating this is the, to me, astonishing and unnerving gullibility of many human beings about the consciousness of robots. When I was working on the COG project with Rod Brooks, now this is already more than 10 years ago, COG was not conscious, not by anybody's definition of consciousness, but COG moved at human tempo and its arms were sort of loosey-goosey and it, and it saccaded its camera eyes mm -hmm. and we had a real problem with these are MIT students mm -hmm. who were organizing civil rights for COG movements and worrying 
about COGS, whether, whether COG was, was, you know, getting all the proper treatment that a conscious robot should have. Uh, so ever since then, I have been, shall I say, not overly impressed with the convictions that people have about the consciousness of anything on the basis of seeing it behave and not knowing what's going on under the hood. So that's an ordinary, my question is really, what have you seen scientifically which makes you think that this is uh, I mean, I think it, maybe, maybe one way going. to put the question is what, there has been a remarkable swing of the pendulum towards recognizing more species as conscious. You know, I remember when I was a grad student, people, you know, primates, maybe chicken, uh, chickens, uh, and okay, part of what explains it is people have come to recognize more sophisticated cognitive capacities among various animals, but there's no way that can explain it all. It's not like people now think bees are more sophisticated than people thought chickens were back then. So something else is going on. The criteria for consciousness have been liberal, liberalized and loosened. And one question is whether that's been a sort of some empirical progress mm -hmm. we've made or whether it's somehow some kind of change in underlying philosophical attitude. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think by way uh, of, of a huge number of, of experiments out there on invertebrates, people venturing forth into invertebrates, um, I think that the pendulum, in a sense, is moving in the right direction, and it's by and large because of some very elegant experimental work, a lot of it pursued by a bunch of invertebrate people, but some not, n not by invertebrate people, but by people who are working on, on so-called lower vertebrates. There's a lot of, and not necessarily directly consciousness bound, not necessarily research that is just, you know, in the direction of consciousness, but, uh, but research in related areas, re research into episodic-like memory, research into things, working memory. Now, I mean, I, 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 will harbor, I harbor a prejudice or a bias that I know a number of people, perhaps in this audience, but a great number of people in consciousness research are against, which is this idea that, in fact, I do, do believe that if you see working memory, if you have evidence of working memory in an animal, you've probably all but cinched a variety of consciousness. I think that that animal, I, I, I saw a shake of the head, so I know, I understand that's not universally accepted. But the bottom line is there's been a huge amount of progress and a lot of it's been pushed by work in the invertebrates and in particular the work that we heard about yesterday um, that involved identifying um, brain regions and circuits that behave functionally a lot like what we are observing and the connectivity that looks a lot in a sense like what we observe Sorry. in the vertebrate model. Let's, let's go to Heather. So I came to this meeting wanting personally answers to two questions. One is there an objective way to measure if other animals or even robots have consciousness? Is it behavioral? Is it what's happening in the brain? You know, can we have an objective non-intuitive measure so that we don't have these mistakes where we think the robot is conscious when it's not, you know, and, and consciousness is meaningful because yes, if I kick the robot, it doesn't matter if it doesn't feel anything, but if it does feel something, then it me it's meaningful. And so, so I think there's some, I feel some satisfactory answered in that realm-ish. I don't think we've obviously, we're not even close to coming to a full answer, but, but then, the, then the second question is, okay, so what do we do with that information in terms of practical things? And that's a more of an ethical, moral question. And then, so I get to this point where, okay, so it, let's assume that they can feel something. What does that mean? Does that mean that's it? We, 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 no one eats meat, no one, or does that, do we come to the conclusion like we should just kill them ethically? you know, anesthetize them, or, you know, Temple Grandin had a whole structure where they move the cattle in a very nice, calm way to, to their death, right? I mean, we don't even, and we're the only species, if you look at the animal kingdom, I mean, they kill each other all the time, and there's a lot of suffering, I mean, because we have, I'm, and that's not an argument. I'm not saying we should be cruel to animals, because I already see him, look, I'm a vegetarian, but, but I think that um, because we have the capacity to not, behave instinctually, that does give us a moral responsibility. But then the question really becomes, what do we do with that? What, what does that mean? And we can't even barely help human suffering. I mean, we do horrible things to human, or allow horrible things to happen to humans. So, so I just want to know, practically speaking, where does the scientific information take us in the practical realm? Can I have a crack at this? It's the same question as Colin. Can yeah, I have a crack I at it? I don't think there's been great progress in understanding the neural basis of consciousness in the last 10 years or the last 50 years. It's not because of that. I also, <clears throat> my percentages on what I think is conscious were not based on scientific breakthroughs. They're based 
on the obvious. And I think what's has changed people now is more YouTube than anything else. Uh, as for, wait, I'm not finished. That's the scientific part. So, so much for the scientific part. The philosophical part will, you know, then, then it's a, 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 that can be handled separately. But the ethical question, and the ones that you raised are sort of standard ones. Yes, animals kill one another in the wild. Yes, they're a predator and prey. We're talking about our species, and the reason we don't rape the reason we don't enslave is because it's not necessary, even if it's in our primate heritage, it's not necessary. So if it's not necessary and it hurts, don't. Okay, let's go to Peter. I was going to offer a, a, a response to Colin's question, but uh, Stephen just said something that's also apropos, so I can express it partly as a response to Stephen. I think that um, the, the general sense uh, in science and philosophy has shifted a lot on this question and I think that in retrospect it will look like, I mean it seems to be, it seems to me to be the situation now, there have been a couple of landmark bits of work that have just changed the whole picture in people's minds. I think Victoria Braithwaite's work on fish has just changed the picture, it's changed what seems like a reasonable view, what seems like a sort of extreme view as opposed to a moderate view in this area and I suspect has changed it permanently. So I think that would, that's a, a real landmark. Uh, they haven't been discussed a lot at this event, but some of the work on crabs and other crustaceans, uh, Robert Elwood's work in particular, I think will come to look the same way, quite likely. I mean, it's not heavily neurophysiological work, it's behavioral work that's very subtle and clever. And in my mind, it's just very hard to come up with a story about um, the results that he comes up with that doesn't attribute uh, there being something aversive it feels like to be a crab in those situations. I don't think it's sort of the obvious and it's sort of driven by impressionistic stuff in the way that uh, Stephen was saying. I think this is regular science, but I think it's sort of, it's clever whole animal science rather than neurophysiological science that's driven it, I think, and just to repeat the fact, I think Victoria's work has, has just sort of changed the whole picture, it's changed what looks like a reasonable view, and I think that the same is beginning to happen with some invertebrates, especially especially crabs and prawns and the like. Okay, Ned, did you want to finish? Yes. Well, I, w I just wanted to go back to the, uh, uh, the dispute between Tom and Dan. What? Um, so I just want to go back to the dispute between Tom and Dan. I think they're both wrong. Um, and I just wanted to say... What about I, animals? No, uh, oh, it's a no. very old debate, which is not no. very much about animals. No, it's not about animals. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Joe. That's all right. <laughs> if you want to do it really quickly, go ahead. Oh, really quick. Really quickly, um, Tom's point of view can be right and a scientific realist point of view can be right. Tom can be right that... Um, um, Th we have a, there's a first-person point of view. Nothing, no science could show we're not conscious. Um, um, I also think that no science could show that, that, that suffering isn't bad. But that's perfectly compatible with a third-person point of view that tries to give a scientific realist account of consciousness. You, you don't have to be a dualist like Tom or something like that. You can be a scientific realist about consciousness while still taking that, that first-person point of view very seriously. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Quickly. Okay. Um, John. So um, I, I do think, and I'm not going to have time to talk about it, that there is a way to think about consciousness, pain, and fear within a hierarchical computational framework in neuroscience. But I'm not going to go into it because I was to ask a question here. Um, two other things. With respect to the One thing. Just to the, with respect to the first-person perspective, all of you in here think that you're seeing a whole crowd, but actually what you're doing is micro saccading on your fovea and then constructing afterwards. So the first-person perspective is wrong even at the level of vision uh, on the fovea. And then also, it, it, the, the, the biggest problem in the neuroscience of consciousness is the belief that the explanation has to have the same subjective feel as the problem it's trying to explain. And I think that's the biggest problem here, is that the explanation will not look like and feel like the thing that you want explained. And most of, in philosophy, I get the impression 
that people get frustrated by scientific third-person explanations because they demand of consciousness, like any, unlike any other area in neuroscience, that the explanation feel like consciousness itself. And I think that has got us in a huge amount of trouble in neuroscience and other areas, and it seems to be haunting us in consciousness as well. OK, let's pass the mic to uh, Hedda. We don't, not all of these are questions for the panel, obviously. Some of them are statements, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like that one. Okay, yeah, so I have a question for Daniel Dennett that's inspired by Frank Jackson's knowledge argument. So imagine someone who has never experienced pain, but they know everything about all the functions of pain, and in particular, the kinds of functions that you just sketched that you think make uh, suffering intrinsically bad, but then they experience pain for the first time, and then it seems, at least to me, that they would learn something new about why pain is bad that they didn't know before, even though they might have already known that it's bad in some sense. Um, they gain more information about this. Um, so if, if this is true, it seems like that there is something that you, about why pain is bad, or an aspect of why it's bad, that you can only know through a phenomenal concept. And furthermore, it seems that phenomenal concepts are intrinsic concepts, so if there is something about why it, pain is bad that can only be known via this intrinsic phenomenal p concept, then pain has to be, at least in part, intrinsically bad. I think you uh, uh, underestimate the knowledge of Mary, in this case, the way uh, everybody underestimates the uh, complete physical knowledge of Mary in, the, in Jackson's actual case. Uh, I just simply challenge your hunch that uh, Mary will learn something when she first feels pain. She knows so much about pain uh, uh, that it will not surprise her at all. Now, you may say, well, of course it will surprise her. Well, that's just because nobody can imagine what it would be like to know everything physical there is to know about pain. So we always underestimate and think that Mar Mary would be uh, surprised. Uh, so I, I, that is, you've offered me a variation on the Jackson experiment, which I see no reason to see as an improvement over Jackson's original experiment. I don't think that our experience of pain is any uh, better an example than our experience of color uh, uh, to make this point. So I'll just drop it at that. Uh, so I had a related question to Dan Dennett about suffering. So at the beginning of your comments, uh, you raised the question of why suffering is bad. And one answer is because of how it feels. But you were, seem to be indicating that that's a cop out. So what I was wondering is, what is your answer to why suffering is bad? I didn't quite catch it from what followed afterwards. Um, years ago, Christoph Koch and I had a great discussion about this. Um, and he, the, the case was a toothache that he had. And, uh, and he said, it's just intrinsically bad. Uh, uh, and I said, well, let me describe two analgesics, and you tell me which one you want to take. Analgesic A, uh, you completely, uh, you feel pain, all right, but it does not distract you, interrupt you, hurt your, improve, uh, uh, diminish your capacity to engage in, in happy conversations and all the rest, but the intrinsic pain is there. That's analgesic A. Analgesic B blots out the intrinsic pain, but you, you can't concentrate, you, you can't dance, you can't sing, you can't enjoy music, you can't do any of those things. Now, which analgesic do you want to take? Okay, Jesse Munton, who's been live tweeting the whole conference. <laughs> Thank you. I was grateful to Peter Carruthers in his talk for articulating an assumption that seemed to be made explicitly or implicitly in a number of talks, which was that when theorizing about consciousness, we have to start from the human case. And my question for the panel is, in what way, if any, is that true? And here are a couple of ways it could be true, neither of which I particularly like. 
A really weak way it could be true is just that we have to start from the human case because that's what we have the most information about. There are conspecifics. Um, we can use verbal report in ways we can't with animals. But that seems really to possibly be a reason, a moral and an epistemic reason, to try harder to not start from the human case, to start from the animal case instead. Here's a really strong claim it could be making, which is that the phenomenon we're interested in is one that I identify through my first-person experience of consciousness, and that's why we have to start from the human case. But that really is a reason to start not from the human case, but from the first-person case. So if we're really going to start from the human case, if I let other people be in my theorizing at the ground floor, why not open that up to let other animals be in there from the ground floor, thereby doing justice to the intuitive openness to attributing consciousness to animals that most people pre-theoretically seem to have? Um, this reminds me of a point that um, Descartes makes in his, I think, in the Discourse on Method, when he, he urges his readers to set aside their idiosyncrasies and just listen to reason and, and basically to be scientists. And this is a man who's talking about consciousness. And this uh, provoked me to think, let's, a little thought experiment, let's imagine a, uh, a group of uh, zombie Martians, they're, they're not conscious, but they're scientists, okay? And they come to Earth, and so they've never experienced consciousness. But if they study our planet, and particularly if they study people, they will learn all about consciousness the same way we do. They'll read our novels, they'll, they'll, they'll overhear our conversations, they'll, they'll uh, they'll come to meetings like this and hear what everybody has to say. They will have a, a wealth of information about what human beings take their own consciousness to be. Now, I, uh, the question of whether they are going to uh, get it all is uh, by no means, I think, easy to answer because they are uh, presumably... Uh, indefatigable researchers who will use every bit of this evidence that they've got. Basically what they're doing is heterophenomenology. I think that's a lovely question. I would go on, I think we are starting from the weak side, really. I think that we start with humans because it, uh, it's available to us and this is the language and we prioritize ourselves, right? We're emergent from the notion of dominion and so Everybody talks about our most sophisticated brain, and that is taken as accepted. And secondly, there is no first per I mean, even the question of first person for a non-human animal is a debatable and debated question. So we can't start there and move forward with our first person because we're already stuck. There's been a tension that has pervaded this whole conference between the scientific and the ethical. And on the one hand, there are all these nuanced considerations as to what constitutes good science and philosophical considerations around that. And on the other hand, there are people here who are deeply concerned about the ethical ramifications of this consideration around consciousness. And there seems to be this implied thing that if we can establish that there's consciousness in animals, that that will help the ethical concerns. But it's not at all clear that that's the case. Um, I would say that even though this conference has underscored the potential for consciousness in bees and in um, octopuses, I don't think that's probably swayed that many people to give up meat eating, for example. And there seems to be an awful lot of research that suggests that people think that meat eating is bad, but that doesn't necessarily affect their own behavior very much. So I'm wondering whether we're in a confused or false dialogue, whether these two things need to be separated from each other in some way, or whether some purpose is really being served by conflating those two subjects. And as a last piece, I'd like to just bring in and uh, Dan's question about is there unconscious suffering? And apparently there's only about 15% of us who put our hands up on that. I was among those 15%, but I felt a bit nuanced in that issue 
because it seems to me the difference between conscious and unconscious suffering is whether you've attended to it. Now, the Buddha, now let me go. Let's go with the question about science and ethics. Okay, well, let me, let me just throw one other thing in here. All right. <laughs> okay, we had a great question about the scientific and the ethical. So anyone want to take it? Sorry, time is already, is already up. So let's, uh, anyone who wants to, wants to take the question about the scientific and the ethical, and then we should really be wrapping things up. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to put in a quick two cents, which is that, you know, I, I guess in a sense as scientists and as human beings, we, we have to appeal to a degree to sentimentality in a way to, to, to provide some motive force. I mean, that sounds, it is, let's face it, it is a little bit cynical or more than a little cynical. But the bottom line is, if you demonstrate things in non-human animals that strike a chord, you know, that's really familiar. Oh my gosh, that, you know. Now, that doesn't necessarily relate directly to consciousness. It's really hard to sort of see how conscious processing directly could, you know, the, the fact of that in a non-human animal could sort of move the ball forward in terms of positive directions and ethical considerations and, and humanity. Um, but I think that's actually really what it reduces to in the end. As scientists, this is what we have to do. How we disseminate the message is at least important, as important as anything else. It may be even more important for moving the ball forward than the actual data or results, their findings themselves. And call that cynical, but I think it's reality. Often in science, the most impressive demonstrations are the failures of people trying to prove that P uh, and instead deciding, oh, I guess not P after all. Uh, and in this area, I would say the most impressive science will be from people who either set out to show that some species really does have feeling and then they, whatever their anticipations were, are, are thwarted, or people who set out in the other direction uh, to take a, I hope, fanciful example, people who are determined that trees are not conscious, uh, who uh, decide they're going to settle that once and for all with some really good science, if that group comes up with results that suggest that trees are conscious, we'll pay much more attention to them, and rightly so, than to the group that went out to prove that trees were conscious. Anyone else want to come in on this? Stephen? Um, the question was, I take it that the question was, what's the relation between the people who are worked up about the science of consciousness and the ethics? Is that what the question is? Well, if we didn't use, Dan just did a favor and used the real word, but if we didn't keep using the weasel words that we use for consciousness, awareness, uh, uh, subjectivity, phenomenal, this, blah, and we just called it, do animals feel? And we had evidence that they feel and that they and, that it, and you could hurt their feelings, then that would have made a difference. But we didn't spend much time on that. Okay, that's all we have time for. Let's thank our panel for a great discussion. <laughs> you guys want to come up? <laughs> okay, and just before you take off, um, a few words of thanks. Dale, do you want to come up here too? Uh, we just want to uh, say a few words of uh, thanks to all the people who have helped make this conference possible. Firstly, to the, uh, to the Cantor Film Center and all their staff and AV, AV people who have been great. Thanks very much.